Summers in Los Angeles were notoriously hot. It's the desert, you know. People don't realize that behind the glitz and glamour of the Hollywood elite, there is just bone dry sand and dust settling under the paved roads and suburban parks. People think that LA is a superficial city with no depth behind its artificial glimmer. But the truth is so much worse. I know this now in part because of the events I'm about to unfold to you all. The year was 1989. The month was June. I was seven years old and fresh out of school, ready to take on three months of uninterrupted decadence and bliss. In those days, the streets were still considered safe, and us kids would take to them by storm, assaulting the parks and parking lots with unprecedented vigor. We'd start the day right, playing baseball or four square with boundless energy, and then idle down to lazy games of horse or hide and seek as the sun bopped its head and dipped beneath the Pacific. Of course, we always took a break when the ice cream man came by. The ice cream man. Oh, how I can still remember his jingle. The sweet crescendo of notes lighting upon our delighted ears. And the subsequent scramble to his dinky white truck for chocolate eclairs and Mickey Mouse bars. As kids, we barely paid attention to the man himself. So fixated we were on the sugary treats. But I recall he was an older gentleman, always quick to flash us a smile, though not overly friendly either. It didn't matter. Inhaling gobs of gooey treats was all we ever cared about when he came by. Every day at 1 p.m., as reliable as a clock tire, the ice cream man would turn lazily down our neighborhood and herald that yes, Today was another hot, sticky, glorious summer day. Our band of miscreants fluctuated day by day. Though there were a few constants, Jenny, our leader, big for a girl her age, and therefore by default a giant in our midst. She was a bully, but she looked out for all of us in her own weird way. Artie, the Jewish kid, his dad worked for someone who worked for someone important, and he liked to tell us that in his snot-nosed, uppity voice. Lakey, who I secretly thought wasn't so bad for a girl, Mike, John, and a couple of others. Me, I was the chubby one, the one whom the others liked to rag on. Ever since I could remember, I was softer than the others, rounder somehow. I didn't think this was fair seeing as I wasn't really that different from the others, but you can understand my retentance whenever the ice cream man came by. After all, what seven-year-old wouldn't laugh at the little fat kid pumping his sausage legs toward his daily dose of sugar? When I think about it now, I can't help but wonder what would have happened if I was born a little thinner, or perhaps had a little thicker skin, if I didn't always hang back, waiting until the others had collected their treats before ashamedly stepping up and pushing a dollar into the old man's hand. But of course, ruminating on such matters is useless. I can only relate what happened. On a particularly hot day that June, I was walking home from the playground with Lakey and John. We were chatting about something or other, alternating between distractedly switching topics and running around as kids are apt to do. We were turning the corner when we saw it, the ice cream truck, parked in the shadow of a group of palm trees. We skidded to a halt like three little pigs, jaws agape. Immediately. Lakey shrieked, Ice cream! and took off for the truck. John and I hung back, both puzzled. The ice cream man usually came to us. It was strange to come across his truck like this. We watched Lakey as she approached, 
stalking the truck like a puppy after a dragonfly. She peered up and got a disgruntled look on her face. Turning back, she shook her head. Nah, no one's there, she called. We shrugged and resumed walking, immediately losing interest. Lakey skipped ahead, while John and I argued over the logistics of a battle between Optimus Prime and Shredder. We had nearly completed the block when Lakey glanced back and waved. It wasn't at us. The ice cream truck had come to life. It inched forward slowly, impeccably down the street towards us. Lakey made to run back, but something in me made me stick my hand out at her. I shook my head silently. What? Lakey pouted. Listen, we did. Like a heavy miasma, the air hung thick and absent of the jingle. He's probably not open, I said. Lakey shrugged an acquiescence, and we resumed walking. The truck's low rumble creeped up behind us. Maybe we all sensed it but none of us felt like talking. It was like something descended down upon the three of us, smothering our carefree play. We walked in uncharacteristic silence, ears straining to hear the truck. Its motor was rapidly growing loudly, a rumbling beast stalking its prey. I dared not look back, but instead, quickened my pace. Lakey and John didn't protest, but followed suit. The truck approached, steadfast and implacable. There were no chimes. Where were the chimes? I finally looked back. The truck was idling again in front of another house. This time, I looked carefully at its exterior. The scratched white paint the colorful images of creamsicles and sundaes adorning the surface. I could see the pits in the pictures, where the plastered-on images eroded away. It wasn't the usual truck, the one the old man drove. This one had an eye on it, carved sloppily into the steel. The eye was wide and bare, and there was a black hole right where the pupil should be. Inside that hole, there was only darkness. I tried to peer inside through another means, but the windows were tinted black. Were they always that dark? I craned my neck, trying to see who the driver was. Then the truck roared to life. The three of us startled and jumped back as it whizzed by us tearing down the street at a frightening speed. I know what I saw then, though the other two denied it. But the side window wasn't tinted, and the driver inside wasn't that friendly old man. He looked heavy set and dressed in a colorful motley. I wiped my eyes from the exhaust and looked at my friends. The three of us stared at each other for a moment and then dissolved into hysterics. The moment had passed, whatever it was, and we could resume our journey home safely. Evening came all too quick, and our games took on a frantic pace as we tried to squeeze every last drop of that summer glow from the day. Lakey, John, and a whole bunch of us were gathered at the park by Lakey's house where the parents could keep an eye on us. We could see them in the distance, stalwart figures keeping keen eyes on their progeny. To us, though, they were the timekeepers, all too ready and eager to set into motion and drag us from our idyllic bliss. The day's events had long since passed from my mind, and we were engaged in a deadly game of dodgeball. I hooked the ball to Lakey, and then laughed as it bounced from her hands. Butterfingers, I crowed. Thankfully, 
that it wasn't me this time who messed up the game, but Lakey didn't care. Her eyes were only for the ice cream truck that had suddenly appeared in the distance. Look, she pointed, heads whipped around in a frenzy. Ice cream, one boy shouted. He came, he came, shrieked a girl, oblivious to the fact that yes, the ice cream man always came, but usually he came earlier when the sun reached its zenith and customers were piling up. He never came this hour, when the light hit the trees at that angle where the world burned. We didn't care. We knew what the truck meant. As usual, I hung back and watched my thinner, faster peers flock the truck. I could see parents moving forward too. As oblivious to this anomaly as the rest of us, I slowly walked up to the truck, then froze in my tracks. It was the same truck as before. That eye peered out in the midst of the plastered images, and this time, I could see that there was a second eye next to it. How did I miss it before? And those images below, those weren't pictures of ice cream. What I thought were chocolate bars were holes. The vanilla cakes were the color of bone and adorned a broken smile, which was lapped with rich ruby red. Nestled in the midst of the colorful treats was a horror to look at. A wide, grinning skull with bleeding lips turned up in a ricus. Nobody could see it but me. The children paid and were hastily unwrapping their bars. Looking back, I think I knew even then what was about to happen. In my imagination, I surged forward, slapped hands away from the ice cream, screamed loud and long, but instead, I just waited and watched. The first girl bit into her bar. She chewed with bliss, and then her eyes popped wide. I watched her little body go stiff and her breathing increase. I watched her chest rise and fall, rise and fall, spasming as she doubled over, choking. By then, the others were choking too. Each fed their own special poison, hand-picked by the ice cream man. It didn't take long. By the time the last one started choking, the first girl was frothing on the ground feebly batting away the bubbles from her mouth. Parents are screaming, rushing by me. One knocked me to the ground and I felt my head hit the grass. I closed my eyes, wondering if this is what my friends were feeling. There was a roar of the engine and then more screaming. I propped myself up, ignoring the writhing figures about and watch the ice cream truck drive away. In the end, 11 children died that day. I was supposed to be number 12, but I was chubby for my age, reluctant to join my friends in their frenzy, always hanging back and always watching. They never caught the guy, you know. Some of you might wonder who he was or why he did what he did. It really doesn't matter to me. As he was back then, he remains an irreconcilable force. Something that should not have been there on that summer day, yet was so very much there. You might think there is no depth to this city, but you are wrong. It's only that beneath the surface of it all, there is but howling, black, purposeless madness. Twenty-one years later, my life remains defined by that day. The media loves me. So do the psychologists. I let them drink their fill. I smile and nod and tell them sure. Maybe someday I'll write a book. Though first I thought to share my story with all you good people. Life seems dull somehow. Fogged by a gray I cannot shake. My mom tells me I should meet a nice woman. 
But all I can remember is that little girl's spasming body. Was it Lakey, who I watched in her final moments? Or someone else? I really can't recall any of their faces now, and that's the saddest part. Lakey, John, Jenny, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't take the plunge with you all. I'm sorry I was so scared, so self-conscious of my fat little body. I know he's still out there, watching and waiting for his next move. I hope he knows he forgot to serve one kid. Lately I've been taking long walks by myself, hoping to turn that corner and find waiting for me my redemption. That little bit of peace that only can come from someone as beloved as the ice cream man. Number 2 When I was 10 or so, I loved going down to the corner of my block and waiting for the ice cream man to come by in his truck every day. It became a ritual for me, waiting for the ice cream man every day, surrounded by other children, anxiously clutching the money their parents gave them, imaging the ice cream they would soon indulge in. The ice cream man himself was a kindly middle-aged man who always dressed up in a striped red and white shirt with suspenders on. I half expected him to be wearing a top hat and hawking tickets to the carnival based upon his appearance. Sometimes he would give out free ice cream to the children who didn't have any money on them. We all came to love him, and he told us to call him Mr. Jeffrey when we saw him. One day, during a blistering hot summer afternoon, I came to be the only person standing on the corner that day, waiting for some ice cream. There was a birthday party going on at the nearby park, and every kid was invited to attend, as it was going to be a block party of sorts. I didn't care for the person who the party was in their honor, so I didn't bother to attend. Rather, I decided I'd be finally able to not have to wait in line to grab some delicious ice cream. I heard the all too familiar jingle of the ice cream van approach, and I scanned the street to see it slowly making its way down to me. The ice cream truck stopped, and Mr. Jeffrey came to the window at the side. Where is everyone? he asked. They grew tired of me already? Or are they just not in an ice cream mood? There's a party going on, I explained. They're all there. Oh, Mr. Jeffrey said. He tapped his temple like he was thinking hard about something. Do your parents mind you being alone out here? They're not home, so they don't know I'm out. I realized I may have said too much. Don't tell, I blurted out. Mr. Jeffrey chuckled. Don't you go and worry about that. Your secret is safe with me. A smile spread on his face. Hey, since you're the only one here, you want to check out the new ice creams I got? Since you're such a valuable customer, he said this with a flourish, which made me smile. I'll even let you try some for free. Free ice cream that no one else on the block had yet to try? There was no way I was turning down that offer. Yes, I said enthusiastically. Mr. Jeffrey opened up the side door to the van. Come in. I started for the door, but then a rare rational thought for a ten-year-old came to the forefront of my mind. I'm not supposed to come into the car as a people I don't know, I thought. The momentary hesitation was spotted by Mr. Jeffrey. You coming, ain't ya? As quick as it came, the warning was banished from my mind. This was free ice cream, not a subject to be treated lightly. I went into the van and heard Mr. Jeffrey close the door behind me. The inside of the band was dank. It smelled strangely earthly. 
On the wall to my right hanged a calendar featuring a nude woman on a motorcycle. This shocked me. I knew I wasn't supposed to be looking at material such as that, so I quickly averted my eyes. Go on and look in the freezer in the back, Mr. Jeffrey instructed. I made my way to the back and opened the freezer. Mr. Jeffrey, I said, this freezer is empty. A pair of hands grabbed the back of my neck and shoved me forward into the freezer. I was too stunned by this to properly react. My head hit the bottom of the freezer and I felt a bit woozy. And when I tried to stand, my head was hit by the closing freezer door. Everything was black and a sense of claustrophobia started to settle in. Mr. Jeffrey, I yelled. I can't breathe. I heard the sounds of a lock being locked and footsteps moving away from me. The ending roared to life, next followed by the jingle of the ice cream van. I yelled again, but I could hear that my yells were being completely muffled. I pounded weakly on the top of the door, but it was sealed shut. After about 10 minutes of me shouting and hitting the door, the engine and jingle shut off and footsteps approached the freezer. Shut the hell up. The familiar voice of Mr. Jeffrey frightened me more than being trapped. I heard the lock unlocking and the freezer door open, giving me much needed fresh air and sunshine. I want to go home, I said. Unbidden, tears came to my eyes. Now listen, Mr. Jeffrey said. His once kindly and friendly face transformed into a steel mask of contempt. We got two ways we can do this. The easy way and the hard way. The easy way would work the best for both of us. But I have no trouble going the hard way either. What do you want? I asked. My parents will pay you money to give me back. They will. Mr. Jeffrey grabbed the top of my hair in his hands and twisted. I started to yell, but he slapped me across the face. Shut the hell up and answer my fucking question. The easy way, I choked out. Good, he said. Mr. Jeffrey reached into the pockets of his pants and pulled out a long knife. Now, just to be sure you listen to me, I'm going to have to hold this. Do you understand? I started to nod, but fear overtook me. Tears starting to stream down my face again, and I felt my bladder let loose. Mr. Jeffrey's face twisted in disgust. You just fucking piss yourself? Get out of the freezer. I stepped out. Now. I want you to start walking ahead of me. Don't try to run. I am faster than you, and I have this knife. I want to walk into the shed right outside this van, and don't turn around. Understand? I nodded yes. Go. I started walking and went outside the van. The shed he was talking about didn't match its surroundings. We seemed to be in the vast expanse of woods that were right outside of town. With this shed being put up in the middle of a clearing, the shed was painted white and looked like a minuscule version of the one-room schoolhouses that were popular in the 1800s. I walked to the shed, all too aware of Mr. Jeffrey's presence behind me. With a shaky hand, I reached out and opened the door. The inside had a small bed pushed to the corner, a small room to the back that was a bathroom, and two armchairs and a TV. Hey son, Mr. Jeffrey said softly behind me. I turned around, puzzled. Mr. Jeffrey had put away his knife and held two ice cream sandwiches in his hands instead. 
You want one, Nick? My name wasn't Nick, but I didn't want to correct him. I took it without saying anything. How many times has your mother told you to say thank you when given something, he asked. I opened my mouth to answer, but Mr. Jeffrey cut me off. Never mind that. She's in Atlanta right now anyways. It's just the good old boys, huh? My mother wasn't in Atlanta. She was at work. What he was saying made no sense. Anyways, eat that quickly because I'm making dinner soon, and I don't want to spoil your appetite. You know we always finish our meals in this house. Mr. Jeffrey stood there staring at me. The ice cream sandwich remained uneaten in my hand. A drip of melting vanilla ice cream falling to the carpeted floor. Mr. Jeffrey started shaking his head. No, 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 he yelled. Nicky wouldn't do that. He wouldn't. He'd eat the fucking sandwich, you ungrateful little prick. He followed this rant with a strong slap to the side of my head. The sandwich dropped to the floor and splattered. Look at what you've done now. Fucking hell. How could I try and think you were Nicky? You'd never be Nicky. Damn you. A look of pure anguish crossed Mr. Jeffrey's face as he said this. His hands curled into fist. He stalked past me and went to the corner of the room where a storage rack was held. He pulled some keys from his belt and started unlocking it. At this time, I noticed the door was a bit ajar. And for the first time that day, I did something mildly intelligent. I ran. My shoulder knocked into the door, and Mr. Jeffrey's head turned around at the sound. He yelled something at me, but I paid no heed and continued on as fast as I could. I sprinted past the ice cream truck and found a dirt trail leading out of the clearing. I followed it down. About halfway down the trail, I heard the unforgettable sound of a rifle cracking. Something whizzed nearby me, and I ran even faster, and didn't stop running until I hit a road that led to the dirt road. A police officer driving by just happened to see me sprint from the trail, and he stopped to see what was happening. When the police went to go arrest Mr. Jeffrey, they found him dead in his ice cream van. He had killed himself with his rifle. A few years ago, when I reached adulthood, I decided to go and try to figure out who exactly Mr. Jeffrey was and why he did what he did. I found out that his wife and son, Nicky, had died in a house fire about a decade before he had abducted me. I assume he wanted me to step in and fill that void his son had left in his life. In a few ways, I can't help but feel a little bit for him. After that experience, I've learned just how deliberating and crippling grief can become. In a twisted way, it was a learning experience, but not one I'd necessarily want to repeat again.